Today I'm going to talk about uh, the meeting of two worlds, Unix and web pen testing. And uh, yeah, that, that's who I am. I have some certification. And I co-founded uh, with some great people a company where I work and do pen testing. And most of it is still web pen testing because it seems that, uh, like Steffi likes to say, that's the way the developers can outsource all these all the crap of uh, multi-platform development to the end users uh, machines and the two titles at, at the bottom are something that this slide is uh, the whole talk is about actually that i'm a pen tester and i like to make tools to scratch my own itches because i believe the whole hacking stuff is about using tools which you could reinvent should the need arise. And this also applies to actually improving the tool set and thus uh, contributing to the whole community. And uh, yeah, in my one of my other hobbies, amateur radio or ham radio, they even have a term for people who are, who are not doing this and just uh, using other people's stuff. Uh, in hacking, we call them script kiddies. In, in ham radio, we even have a nicer term, appliance operators. Those who buy buy the whole kit and just you know turn the knobs and other things. So uh, my plan is to go through this structure, but if you have any deep questions, we can really focus onto some topics. But this is something uh, that is a typical way of explaining what I did and why I did it. So first of all, if you are not uh, familiar with web app penetration testing. Burp suit is basically the tool which everyone agrees on being somewhat usable for its task, and some people even say that it's gold standard. And while it's closed source, it, it comes as a jar file, and you can run it uh, where you have any kind of Java uh, runtime equipment uh, environment. Uh, it could be extended using the so-called extender, which is really just a fancy plugin system. and uh, why it's good? Because, first of all, they can get people through a, ga a gate drug called uh, Community Edition, which is free and it's bundled with Kali Linux and Backtrack Linux back at the time. And at the same time, it, uh, it has a Pro Edition, which has tools where we couldn't really find an exact match in other products. So it's a gold standard because it provides the right kind of tools in a neat single package. So while there are other tools, they can usually not provide one thing or another which we need. And these are some of those alternatives. So for example, OWASP Zap is free and uh, it's free software in both senses, but it's, it's, it's complicated. Uh, Mitten Proxy is really great. I even shown it to you in previous year, years uh, presentations, for example, when I used uh, some scripts to extend it, but yeah, it's 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 just not burp. So it's it's useful for some sub uh, problems, but not for pen testing as a whole. So I I would look really really weird way to anyone who would say I do pen, web pen testing, I do comprehensive web app testing, and I only use Mitten proxy. So with this in mind, uh, since I talked about creating tools and contributing to the community. When you want to extend the software, uh, in this case, I went into Burp Extender and Mitten Proxy because I don't know what Zap uses, although I've heard that it's somewhat compatible with Burp because they both use Java as the runtime environment. But for example, in Burp Extender, you have to use languages which can produce something that the JVM, the Java virtual machine, can uh, digest. So it's usually Java. And there is Jiton and JRuby uh, for Burp, so it's got really native support. You just you just had need to select a .py or .rb file, but it's 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 worst of both worlds. But I will talk about this later. And development cycle is really slow because you need to you, you have a you have a huge initial investment, so-called initial investment. Uh, where you need to start uh, making a simple extension to to understand how the whole thing works. And then, even then, you have to really make some changes and then compile it if you use Java or just uh, re reload the whole plugin when you use JRuby and Jiton. Both of them are slow. 
and you have really, really complicated uh, methods to get uh, some debugging out, but you cannot really debug it in the, in the usual sense of attaching the debugger. And then, of course, you cannot really compose them. So there is no easy way to just join two of these building blocks together. So it's, it's not like Lego. It, it's, it's like having huge cardboard boxes, which, which are, uh, some of them are spheres, some of them are, are other shapes, and they just don't fit together. For Mitten Proxy, you're even more limited because you have to use Python, and you have to use the version designed for dumb people. And uh, the problem is, if, even that they actually have a really good good uh, good uh, development cycle speed because when you save that Python file it reloads and and if you find the right combination of letters because Mitten Proxy has a console user interface which means that if you know those 100 uh, combinations then you can use it uh, otherwise it's not really discoverable but once you know which uh, key to type to get the STDR output then it's kind of fast, but at the same time, it also it, it's not designed to compose these little things. And I created Piper, which you can use any language for, and it has fast development cycle, and you can compose all these little things because we love Unix. Uh, while you could say that, yeah, uh, but I have this uh, problem which which is long standing, and I've been developing this uh, plugin for for years. Yeah, that's really great. Then you should create a burp extender plugin, or you should create a mitten proxy extension, something. But in pen testing, there are lots of uh, scenarios where you have this application and it uses some kind of custom thingy that the developer thought they are really smart, and you have to create a one-off solution. You have to create it fast, debug it fast, because you have to use that for that assessment, and then most probably you will just throw it away. Of course, you will in one of your directories and 10 years later you can go to a camp and show it to people see this is what I created but no you cannot really use it anymore it's for that specific world and last time I, I talked at this camp about uh, creating burp extensions I had a really really <coughs> problematic relationship with it because I had to use Java because yeah I have Jiten and Jeruby but it, while I like writing things in Python, Jython is not, not C Python. So you cannot just say import requests. It's, it's, it's ju just the syntax of the language. That's the only thing that's the same. The whole ecosystem is different. You only, you, you only uh, have access to a single source file. So you'll have to make thousands lines of spaghetti monsters, people who are doing this. And it's also slow. So yeah, I still don't like Java. So I found this interesting thing this year for this project called Kotlin, which is something like a modern language for JVM. So it looks a bit like Python or, or maybe a bit like Rust and Go. So it's got this new way where even if you compile to a statically typed and strictly typed language, you can still use shorthands and not declare types if the compiler can figure it out what type you're using. Uh, if you don't understand why it's much better than Java, here's this link. You can see that it's, it's removed all the warts that, that made it uh, difficult to code in and they could remove it. So uh, in the next four section, I will show you for different problems which Piper aims to solve and hopefully at the end of these four sections you will see why Piper is great or not. So first of all when you want to compare things because that's one of the basic steps of, of you send instructions to a remote system some kind of response arrives and you try to see what difference it make if you make changes in the input. It's really basic. A built-in tool called Comparer, and uh, it has two uh, working modes, words and bytes, which is for us most like, uh, like uh, text and binary thing. And the thing is that, that it, it's not really usable. So it's, it's usable for some scenarios, but they didn't really improve it. So I'm not sure if, yeah, I will have some screenshots later to show, but you, 
its differences, but you have to scroll the whole document to find where those changes are. There is a checkbox called sync views, but it doesn't help with actually finding them. It's just that you don't have to have two scroll bars trying to find things. And there is no option to perform some, some form of canonicalization, so C14N, because 14 letters were removed between C and N. And uh, that also makes it hardly usable because you, you, you can only see the difference between the two formats, but I will show you examples why this is important. But this slide is about why the built-in implementation is hardly enough for serious work. And uh, this whole Piper thing came out of trying to build several little burp extensions and after a certain amount of time realizing that these all point into the same direction and it's really one single tool that I'm looking for. I want to use external tools which are already written and I don't want to rewrite them because I'm not smarter than those developers. I just need to create a bridge between these two worlds. And for example, for texting, uh, diffing text, for example, git diff is pretty great because while it is a git command, it can be used without being in a git directory and uh, it has these neat little options which can help formatting this stuff. I will show how different it is from other kind of stuff. Uh, so for example, yeah, let's look at it right now. For example, here we have two JSON files and if I say git diff, it shows only a, only a, a three lines of context and then only highlights what's differing and it has neat little coloring. So I didn't even supply any kind of uh, extra command line options. And, and it works great. And uh, for example, with the minus W, it can ignore white space, which is cool if the web application puts in little tabulators and everything. Or for example, minus minus color words can help you where Okay, you have two long lines which are differing, but I'm only interested in that single word in the middle that changed. So, for example, git diff is much better than the built-in one. For binary diffing, uh, one of my uh, go-to tools is vbin diff, which can be installed in most operating systems quite easily. And uh, it's basically a hex viewer where you can just scroll up and down with the, with the arrow keys. And the, the great thing is that by pressing enter or return, you, you immediately jump to the next. So it, if you have a huge file with only a, a small differing parts, it's the easiest one because you don't have to behave like a monkey and scroll through and hope that you don't miss any kind of colored stuff. So uh, just to show you an example, here we have two uh, slightly different certificates in their format. And uh, the red, line, red uh, octets show what's differing, and if I press enter, I'm jumping always to the next difference. And now I'm at the end. Yeah, and also if you just need a simple hex viewer that can do find and things like that, if you only, only give it a single file name, then you'll get a single file view. So, for example, this two is already written and should be integrated. Also, uh, the, for those of you using Radare, uh, Radare 2 has this tool called Radif, and uh, it also has nice ANSI coloring, and, and by that last thing that it can do anything, that actually means that, that for example, when I say minus X, then it presents this nice view where the green parts are, what are the same in both files, and the red parts are differing, so it's really easy to see uh, what, what are the same things in both files. And it, it also have options for, for example, producing output that can be used in radar, other Radar 2 tools, so it's, it's like all the Radar 2 things. If you learned all the, all the command line switches, it's, it can do everything for you, but it's still better than the built-in diffing tool. And then to toot my own horn at the left, uh, at the end we have flow diff, which I've written for for uh, discovering 
unknown network protocols and it can diff more than two files. So when you capture like four handshakes and want to see what are the patterns that are always the same, a little bit different, really, really different because it's a hash or it's of other kind of cryptography. Uh, you can look it up there and it's, it was, it was built for a different purpose, but as it turns out, it can be used for file diffing as well. So the great thing about, uh, about Unix is that you can pipe commands after one another, which means that the output of one command can be uh, tied directly to the input of another command, like a human centipede. And, uh, and for example, in diffing, you could say that, yeah, I want to see what the, what the differences are between these two files, but first I want to uh, perform a transformation on both of these files because diffing the output of that gives a more meaningful result. And uh, it's not easy. So right now, for example, the program uses a really simple logic to try to figure out what can be combined with what. But for example, I could offer all the combinations which would give you a huge list. Or you could be offered to select it manually. It's, it's difficult. I, this is still an open problem for Piper. So uh, I'm open for any suggestions. But to show you how it can be done, first of all, this is a burp text diff. Could you spot where the difference is? How can you not spot it? It's right there. There. Don't you see it? It's it's a little bit bit yeah. You don't see it. While uh, on the other hand, for example, in this same these are the same inputs. So this is a JSON. This is also a JSON, but all both inputs I are piped through this Python built-in tool. Uh, when you have Python minus M JSON dot tool, it formats the JSON input uh, by indenting and putting everything in a new line, and then it runs git diff on it. And this is already built into Piper. Now you see, th this is the whole output. It's not cropped. This previous image it was cropped because it was much much longer, but here you only see the the three lines of context and what has changed. Burp binary diff is a bit bit better than the text, but still not ideal because you only have this. While, for example, for the same input, these are both uh, uh, X509 uh, certificates. In this case, I, I said to Piper, please pipe both certificates through OpenSSL's text output and then git diff those so now you can see which are the, which are the semantic uh, meaning of the differences between these two inputs. And I could go on and on. The implementation of the background is like, is like this. We have requests or responses which you select. And you can define for each tool what are the limitations for the number of inputs. So for example, if you have a tool that can only uh, work on one file, for example, it's, it's, it shows you the contents, then it can be only one. But for a diff, it could be two or even more. For example, flow diff can handle more. And you can also define filters so that the irrelevant menu options aren't shown in the, in the user interface. So for example, in the OpenSSL case, we just simply defined that, uh, that uh, DER uh, serialized uh, sequences start with uh, hex 3082, and then it ignores everything else, and it's quite fast to match. I'll talk about filters later because it's a common thing here. And uh, then <coughs> it executes the command with the parameters you said. And then in the end, it can show you the output either in its own window, or for example, if you define the, such a Unix command that has its own GUI window, then of course it's optional because there is no need for it. And uh, I even imported a simple implementation that can show you these ANSI color sequences because many commands come with that. And if you want cross-platform, it's not an easy solution. So I, I imported one. Now the next thing is about formatting thing, things. So when you open up burp, it can do some basic formatting. So it has like row where it just displays the whole HTTP request and response. 
It can decode URL encoded parameters into a table. It can do a hex them, but it's ugly. And it can encode a handful of formats, but it stops. For example, it, it, it can do AMF. Do you know what AMF is? It's used by Adobe Flash. So it's, they wrote it back in the day and just didn't touch it ever since. While we have JSON already, and uh, Burp has a weird relationship with it. So it can highlight JSON in certain circumstances, but not in others. So it looks like as, as the developers recognize that, yeah, JSON is happening, but we don't want to touch it that much. Also, we have ASN1, which is typically serialized as uh, DER, the Distinguished Encoding Roots Format, which is a binary serialization format, just like protocol buffers. And you need a viewer to view it, because otherwise it's just a random crap of bytes. And uh, there are some extensions we, which, provide, uh, which provide message viewer, even in some cases editors, where you can use it to edit the message, for example, in the repeater tool. But these are not. These do not cover everything, and it's it's you always have to write that extension for the specific purpose. And for example, I since I started uh, testing mobile applications, I when they when they use HTTP as the transport protocol for their API communication, I see lots of ASN one there encoded stuff. For example, they are building their own. Uh, CA and uh, and with this you can you know serialize certificates private and public keys so that you can use it to set up your own PKI system and uh, as I mentioned earlier you can it's really easy to spot based on the first two octets of the input and OpenSSL has this really nice tool called ASN1 Parse which produces readable text output from this from this binary crap. And also there is dumpy SN one, which is a bit better because it offers better defaults for, for example, for nested structures where a structure is embedded into another structure and so on. <coughs> for example, in Piper, uh, maybe you recognize this, this bar here, which is the default burp, burp uh, message viewer. So the default tabs are the row headers hex. And I already have uh, the OpenSSL ASN1 decoder inserted by Piper. And now dump ASN1 is the, the active one. And it's, it does this beautifully. So there is no need to write a specific extension when you can just create this meta extension where you can define that. Just call this tool, pass the input through a standard input or via file names at the command line. And the output should be piped back right into this. That's why it's called Piper, because it's doing piping. I'm not good at naming things. And of course, the implementation is a bit similar. So here we only have a single input, because uh, we are implementing a so-called message editor in burp terms, which is not necessarily an editor, because it can define itself as read-only. And then it can also have a filter so that the tab doesn't appear at requests where it's not relevant. And it executes the the command, passes the input, and then the output back to burp. And it works perfectly. Uh, the ANSI color is the same as in the other case. Ah, and then there is this really interesting things where we write uh, things at the same uh, letters on two sides of number two. And this is only a wordplay because there are lots of protocols right now which uses end-to-end -end encryption, which is good, especially since uh, many of our clients are banks. They figured out that uh, it's good for them if they strip SSL at the edge of the network, but then they realized, okay, but then they don't have end-to-end -end encryption, so they decided to add another layer of encryption within HTTP because it's always good to add other layers of complexity and it doesn't affect the tech surface ever. Uh, for example, uh, these APIs are really hard to test. So when you just launch a scanner, it won't do anything because, for example, just a simple uh, first versions of OAuth, for example, they had this nonce 
which is a shorthand for number used once. So you can only use that number for a single request and you have to generate a new one. And you need to calculate a signature based on that nonce and the parameters. So when the scanner tries to mutate all the parameters sent in the request, well, the first line of defense would be the, the authorization server, which would say, okay, the signature is not valid, so I'm not even processing this request, even though further processing might contain like uh, SQL injections and stuff like that. So even for this simple person, it, it would not be usable. I actually wrote a burp extension for that back then because I didn't realize that I need Piper, but right now I'd say it was pretty pointless to go into that for a single task. There is also WS security, which is for web services using SOAP, where it can be signed or even encrypted, and thus you need a complicated solution. And Brida is a really nice example. So they go one step further than I do. So they have a really specific goal where you have a mobile application, like a thick client, communicating over HTTP, and you can't really figure out how the encryption works. For example, it, it even involves the, the crypto hardware of the phone, so you cannot extract the key material even if you wanted to. And they say that, yeah, they bridged together Frida, which is a nice reverse engineering environment that actually works on iOS and Android, unlike GDB, for example. And then you take Burp and make, make, uh, make it work like Burp creates a request in the scanner, then sends it to the phone through Frida. The application does the encryption magic, and then it goes back and then to the network, and the same way, the other way around when it comes back. It actually works, so it's not stupid, but it's one alternative to what I envisioned. So it's, it's really, it's worth reading their blog post about it. And for example, in Piper, I've actually used Piper for such an, such an uh, assessment where I modified the client to use our, uh, our public key for which we know the private key. But then, of course, the server wouldn't, wouldn't be able to implement, uh, to read the message. So we need, uh, we need a message viewer so that we can decrypt it. But that's something I already talked about uh, two sections before, that we can now write our own message viewers. And of course, when it goes out to the server, we need to either re-encrypt it, because if it comes from the phone, we need to decrypt it with our private key and then encrypt it with the server's public key. It sounds complicated, but it's not. And uh, for scanner, the scanner needs to operate on plain text. Uh, so th we just need to encrypt it once with the server's public key. And uh, for these kind of manipulations where you want to perform something on the HTTP requests that are going out or the responses coming in, Burp offers the so-called HTTP listeners and in this case, uh, we are already talking about a single input. And uh, you can sign up for either processing requests or responses, but not both at the same time. And it really doesn't even make sense because usually the format is whole different between the two. And you can also define filters for this. Uh, the important other filter is that you can filter what tools you are uh, accepting these requests and responses from. Because, for example, you want to say that from the proxy, where the original app is communicating, you need other processing because you need re-encryption than, for example, scanner or intruder, where you need just a single pass of encryption. So it's, it's really useful that you can do that. And then it goes towards the server, or, or if you define this for responses, then it goes right back into the burp like nothing happens. So it's transparent. On the other hand, you have macros. And two years ago, I talked here about uh, how you can use macros, which are a bit similar and at the same time different. Uh, that's when I drew this little UML diagram because uh, burps, macros are, well, actually it's called session handling rules, are so complex that I had to draw a UML. I mean, when something is so complex that drawing a UML makes it easier to understand, you know that something is wrong. Yeah, but
session session handling rules because many web applications are stateful so it's not like i can send as many requests uh, that i want and the server will always be in the same state when it tries to process that request so you can define so-called session processing rules in burp there is even a default one that tries to handle handle cookies so that when the server replies with a set cookie then the next uh, request will contain that cookie but you can define your own rules and uh, and uh, for this Piper can also do macros and you can tie them into this kind of session handling rule and it has this nice thingy where you can use Burp's GUI to define it and it has its own debugger and tracer so you can see how Burp tries to use these rules. So I wouldn't say it's better or worse than HTTP listeners, it's another tool and usually you can see for your own task if it's better or not. And uh, for example, a huge difference is that if you launch a request from repeater and you use a macro and you modify the request, it will be back ported. So you just see that I clicked on the go button and my request changed in the window. So for example, for an encryption stuff, it would be awful. But uh, it could be useful, for example, incrementing a counter so I can get unique requests. For example, testing a registration page where they, where they uh, expect to have a unique email address upon every request. That, that's better, for example. So that, that, that's about macros. And my last thing is the commentator. And uh, the prior art is also mine. Uh, I figured out that the proxy window has this comment column and it's not really used. I mean, of course, if I double click on it, I can enter my own comment and this is great. I can also color it like uh, like uh, when when school girls and school boys discover that they have these highlighters. And uh, I figured that maybe we can use it for something useful. And I came up with commentator, which uh, was created in a simple way that you enter a regular expression, which uh, has to contain at least one group, and uh, it evaluates the regular expression either on requests or responses, depending on what you select from that combo box. And then the first group from that regular expression evaluation goes into the comment section. It's great if you want to have an overview, for example, when the URL is the same for five requests, but you want an automated way to see in the comment section which request am I talking about, which contains that, that uh, important sequence. So this is already downloadable. It's been in the Burp store for years. It works. But yeah, I could use regular expressions for everything. Then there are some people who ask on Stack Overflow why they can't use it for everything in their life. And this is a really, really famous response to that. By the end, it, it, it goes really bad because regular expressions are not, they are not a tool for everything. There's even the saying that uh, if you have a problem and say, oh, I'm gonna use regular expressions, now you have two problems. So yeah, it's, it's problematic. So I decided to, widen Piper and put these commentator things in right inside. So you can use any kind of uh, Unix command. And of course, then you only have a single input because it's processing a single request or response and you can filter it and then the output goes into the comment section. So for example, uh, just last week I found a new use case for it. You have lots of requests and you're interested in where the response was identical to another. Here I just created a single command, uh, a single command where I want to execute uh, SHA-256, uh, yeah, 256, and then I have the SHA hashes in the comment, and for example, if I just click on the header, it orders them, and now I see which requests had different responses. So it's really easy this way, and I didn't have to create a whole new extension to make it work. And now I'm getting towards the end of it, so I have, I think, th three slides about internal, which might not interest anyone, so I try to be fast, but this is for the nerds. For example, everybody loves their serialization formats. For example, for this case, I, 
I chose protocol buffers because it generated immutable objects. So I only described how the, how the Piper configuration should work in a simple text format. And it generated uh, these objects which are immutable. So it's really safe to just pass references around because there is no, no uh, problem when someone tries to modify it because there are no modifying methods. And uh, it can provide also a serialization format. So this is what I use to store the preferences on what what you uh, what you, what tools you configured into. And for this, I'm using these these uh, burp commands, which are provided to all extensions. And I compress it with gzip and uh, use this base 85. It's better than base 64 because that requires uh, uh, four thirds of the space of the original, while base 85 only requires five fourths. So it's a bit better. And that is the path where it's stored. The garbage is actually some almost non-printable thing, which I don't re realize why they use it, but it's there. So if you want to look it up how it stores it, that's where you can find it. And of course, I didn't re uh, only use first because then people couldn't really copy their configs easily. So the protocol buffers is only used behind the curtains so that when you close burp and reopen it, all your settings are still there. And for, for exchanging these configuration files, I used the uh, YAML or YAML. I'm not sure what the YAML, okay. Uh, so they say it's human friendly and it's actually, well, well the, the least human unfriendly uh, would be a better, better description, but it actually works and can describe, uh, uh, it can des describe complex situations more easily because I looked at lots of uh, text formats. For example, JSON is, well, well it's JSON. Uh, and for example, down there is an example of the, uh, I already mentioned the JSON dot tool from Python, the default distribution. I think it's quite readable. So prefix means that you have to put these before the the file name of the inputs, and of course you have postfix if you need to put any kind of uh, command line options after it, and then you have to pass uh, pass the input through the standard input. You have a name, and then. Uh, the thing I, I didn't choose, for example, inifies instead of this, is that you need nesting because these filter expressions can be nested. So you need a text serialization format that can actually support any kind of, uh, any number of levels for nesting. So that's why I choose this. And not everything is present here. So for example, the user can enable or disable. These are not uh, specific tools. They are not exported in YAML because it belongs to the user and not to anyone who shares it with. So, yeah. And last but not least, filters, which which I promise you. Uh, you can, the, the easiest one is a simple prefix or postfix, where you can say uh, binary uh, bits, or you can define uh, just a simple UTF-8 uh, text, that if the request starts with or ends with, for example, in this case, this, uh, JSON tool, it's really simple. If it starts with uh, with these curly braces and ends with curly braces, then it's JSON and this will process it. And also the same with square, square brackets. And uh, you can also define regular expressions for matching it. You can define uh, matching for certain headers, but of course it only uh, makes sense for HTTP requests where, you, where there is a notion of headers. And the, the tricky thing is the first uh, form of nesting. You can define command matches where you say that execute a command on this input and then the output of that command can be filled. So just to tell you a really, really simple thing, I want to check if the, imp if the request has an image in it or the response has an image in it. What's the easiest? I execute file on it and I, and I specify the command line parameter to give a MIME type back and I just check if it starts with image slash. Easy peasy. And you can also match on exit codes if the tool provides information in that, unlike uh, GNU PG. 
And of course, then there is the other recursion. You can define any level of ands or ors, so you can build up any kind of complex filters that work, and also you can negate it, so you can really build anything based on it. And uh, all that I've talked about is already out there, so I've been publishing the source code as I've been developing, so it's not kept in secret. The license is GPL because uh, of some parts are, I use, so I just let, let my code become viralized to GPL. The configuration GUI is complete, so now you don't need to twiddle config files by hand. You can do it, but you're not compelled to do so. And the core functionality is kind of in a way that it worked for me on several assignments, but that doesn't mean that I've tested everything through. Uh, so yeah, pull requests are welcome, either finding bugs or new features that I haven't thought of and would still fit in this really wide scope because this is a kind of meta extension, so it doesn't do anything. It just lets, ma makes you able to perform things by invoking uh, external tools, but, well, let's hope that uh, we can make it even better. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? It was too meta. You can ask meta questions in that case. Yes, actually. Yeah. There's three tools that I'd like to recommend for your attention. Let's talk about Viper. It's, uh, it's a yeah. You can use on Viper. Yeah, so definitely. The tool that I would like, but what I would like mostly recommend is WGIF, uh, which is one of my favorite GIF tools. It is, uh, it's, it's something which is a line by line GIF, uh, but it's executed. So if you have like a prompt, Natural language. Natural language text. If you want to do something like that, then DWGIF is the best GIF tool that you can have, actually. Uh, because it, it doesn't matter in what order stuff it is, it only highlights really, really the, the, the important changes. Whereas the traditional uh, programming GIF, there's a, an ordering of the lines that also matters. So you change the order of the lines that matter. And uh, it's just as simple as DWGIF is. Uh, Yeah, but for example, if you if you if you are testing an endpoint which presents you an output and you want to see if those have meaningful differences, I think this is very useful. So thank you. Flow diff. Flow diff uh, a few years ago, and uh, I was wondering if that also makes sense in uh, comparing flows that you captured with an SDR. Have you ever done that? Like demo uh, messages or, or something like that? 
for the module yes so so for that it, it's a really the, the diff part is really basic so it's it's like they all start from the same byte and for example if you insert one byte it goes haywire and said oh all the other bytes are changed because it's been inserted but if you have a clean demodulation where it doesn't have such problems it works quite well so it was designed for for capture the tcp streams but it could very well work for any any form of for any source of these information other questions well uh, i have this here so during the camp if you see me near my computer and ask me how this works i can show you and i can do demos and let's make it even better thank you Thank <laughs> you.